Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today I'm really thrilled to be joined by Dr. Erin Mikos. She's Director of Preventive Cardiology at the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Director of the Impact Center at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, Co-Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Preventive Cardiology. And there is no one better than her to talk to us about the menopause approach for women with cardiovascular disease. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on this program. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is how the transition itself through menopause influences our cardiometabolic risk factors. Yeah, it, it influences it a lot. Um, and that's why menopause uh, is a good time in a woman's life to, to get a heart check, to get a good cardiovascular checkup. Um, so there's a lot of changes in a number of cardiovascular risk factors. So with the loss of estradiol, there's a shift to a more atherogenic lipid um, a panel, meaning that there is an increase in LDL cholesterol, increase in triglycerides, a, a drop in HDL cholesterol. Uh, women tend to then shift uh, uh, fat deposition to, to the visceral cavity, uh, to the abdomen. Um, and so this is associated with more insulin resistance. Uh, there can be uh, an increase in blood pressure in some women around this, this time as well. Um, and so there's a, a number of cardiovascular changes uh, that can impact a women's cardiovascular health. So it's important for all women to, um, to get their cardiovascular risk factors checked. So when we think about vasomotor symptoms, and we know that there is a wide disparity in the, in the how, you know, how early they present, how late they present, how frequent, severe, how long they last. So the relationship between the vasomotor symptoms and cardiovascular risk, what does that tell us? Yeah, so I find, especially among cardiologists, that uh, you know many clinicians are unaware that vasomotor symptoms are, uh, uh, when they're frequent or excessive or, or you know persist for a long time, can be associated with an elevated cardiovascular risk. You know, very few cardiologists or clinicians in general outside of GYN, you know, even ask women about their vasomotor symptoms, and women are often. Um, you know, embarrassed to sometimes bring them up. There's unfortunately a lot of stigma around transitioning through menopause, even though this is a normal life transition for all women. So we know that 70 to 80% of women experience vasomotor symptoms, but yet only a quarter or so seek help for them. But um, wonderful work uh, by Dr. Rebecca Thurston and others from um, uh, the SWAN study uh, and other studies have shown that women who have vasomotor symptoms that are more frequent, such as having more than six episodes in a two-week period, or when they're persistent, when they're lasting, you know, a number of years, you know, beyond five years, this is associated with increased cardiovascular risk, you know, even up to two decades later. So this is yeah. an unrecognized risk factor for cardiovascular disease that often clinicians and, and patients don't know about. Yeah, so important. You know, we think about smoking, we think about cholesterol, but we don't think about that. And we just think, oh, this is common. In, now let's look at the age of the onset of menopause and how that should be influencing us as healthcare practitioners when we're seeing a patient, um, someone who's early or versus premature or average age of menopause in their mid fifties. This is a different story here. Yes, so absolutely. So I think most clinicians are familiar with the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, lipids, blood pressure, smoking, but there are risk factors, you know, unique to women that impact their risk across the lifespan. And, you know, some of these are related to adverse pregnancy outcomes, but early menopause is one of them. So when the men menopause onset is before the age of 45, we call that early. When it's before the age of 40, we call that premature. Uh, it really is sort of linear that the early Earlier of the onset, sort of the, the greater the risk for cardiovascular disease. And so it's important that clinicians take a comprehensive reproductive history because the identification of a factor such as early onset of uh, menopause should prompt, um, you know, more uh, intensive preventive efforts. So if someone is already at borderline or intermediate risk, actually our current um, cardiology guidelines that I was part of, the ACCHA primary prevention guidelines, um, 
um, says that early menopause is a risk enhancing factor that would put a woman into a higher risk that may favor the initiation of statin therapy. Um, although if uh, the risk is uncertain, sometimes I do some additional tests such as a coronary calcium score to see if a woman has a, a plaque in her arteries or not. Uh, and if she does, that's certainly a sign that we need to start um, treating with a more intensive preventive therapy. So if, you know, we have a patient in front of us and they're wanting to initiate menopausal hormone therapy because they have intractable symptoms that are really interfering, um, what kind of cardiovascular risk assessment or screening would you suggest that we do? And is it very different than what you would do from a cardiologist standpoint? Right. So I think this is a really good point because I think there's been a lot of misinformation after the Women's Health Initiative, which really included much older women who were quite farther from the menopause transition. So menopause hormone therapy certainly doesn't have to be avoided in all women and can be very safe in low-risk women, particularly those around the menopause transition who were under the age of 60 or within 10 years of menopause. But oral estrogens um, can be hypercoagulable, so they are recommended to be, um, or systemic um, um, estrogens are recommended to be avoided in women who are at high cardiovascular risk. So they're contraindicated in women who have established cardiovascular disease or have a history of uh, venous thromboembolism or uh, prior breast or endometrial cancer. Um, and, but, you know, in women who are, have risk factors, but are not known to have cardiovascular disease, sometimes uh, we have to do an additional assessment. So um, from our menopause clinic at, at Hopkins, um, I get referred to a, a lot of these women who, you know, are not clearly low risk, but not clearly high risk. And so in these cases, I often do a coronary artery calcium score. Um, as plaque is building in the arteries, a certain percentage of it become calcified. And so the presence of, of calcium indicates that there's atherosclerosis in those arteries, and uh, this does put a woman into a higher risk category. Um, so when there's uncertainty, sometimes I get this test, um, you know, if the score is zero, that does put them into a low risk category. And, you know, I generally, uh, you know, I would proceed with menopausal hormone therapy, just like I would a low risk woman who doesn't have cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and sometimes this is important because sometimes I'll see women who are like 60, 65 and really can't be weaned off their hormone therapy yet, but they're getting into the age where we start to be concerned because they're, you know, a little, you know, farther beyond the menopause transition at this point. And so it's often those women that'll get a, a coronary calcium score. And if their score is zero, that does put them into a much lower risk group. Um, so I can be a little bit more reassured than if we find that they actually have, you know, subclinical coronary disease. Um, by detection of, of an elevated coronary calcium score. Yeah, and on our last scientific meeting, and uh, you did talk a lot about the selective use of the coronary artery calcium mm -hmm. or the CAC score, as we call it. So you've mentioned some women um, that you would consider in older women, women where we're not sure, but what about patients transitioning through menopause? Certainly this is not a standardized test that we would throw at all women, so to speak. It's an expensive test that involves some radiation. Who might that targeted woman be who's transitioning through menopause who could potentially benefit from this? Right. So I'll definitely, um, it's not indicated for everybody, but just for some reassurance, it's actually not a very expensive test because this is not the Good. same as a full lung CT, chest CT. You know, many places, um, insurances do cover it um, more often now because it's in our cardiology guidelines for this selective appropriate use, but out of pocket, it's 75 to a hundred dollars. And the radiation is very low. This is not a full chest CT. Uh, this right. is gated to the cardiac beat. So it's one millisieverts, which is the same as a mammogram. Um, mm -hmm. Um, this is also the same as the background radiation and walking around the U.S. In, in one year's time. And so this is not a test we get every year like a mammogram. So right. for the amount of information we get, you know, one millisievert is, is low risk. Uh, for So I wouldn't let that deter. So if somebody, you start, the guidelines recommend starting with this 10-year risk assessment. And that involves, you know, putting in these traditional risk factors and calculating or estimating someone's 10-year risk for cardiovascular disease. And so generally, low-risk individuals, less than 5% 10 year risk, we kind of just keep reassuring and, and we're working on lifestyle. We're high risk women above 20% 10 year risk. You know, those are individuals that would benefit from lifestyle and statin therapy for prevention. But there's that big group in the middle, this borderline intermediate risk. It's anywhere from five to 19% estimated 10 year risk. And that's where we consider these risk enhancing factors. There's a lot of risk enhancing factors, but early menopause is one of them, as well as having a prior history of preeclampsia. 
But um, after you consider those factors, sometimes there can still be uncertainty about a patient's risk, um, whether a patient would have a net benefit from statin therapy. You know, let's say their cholesterol is, you know, um, only mildly elevated, you know, do they need a statin or not? And so that's where doing more personalized risk assessment and figuring out, do they have plaque in their arteries? And so in our US guidelines, we give it a 2A indication for the selective use of coronary calcium when risk is uncertain. Right. to help um, refine cardiovascular risk and guide shared decision-making about the benefit of preventive therapy. And as I mentioned, a cal calcium score of zero would put someone to a lower risk group where potentially statins could be deferred if that's the patient's desire, but um, a score above 100 or above the 75th percentile, statins are recommended. And statins should be considered you know, um, in anybody who has a score that's not zero, because that means that there's some plaque there. Okay. And lastly, before I let you go, um, you know, a lot of primary care, a lot of OB guys, we, we're sort of at the, the doorstep of seeing these patients and offering therapy. So the question is, is that for those of us who are seeing these women, how do we identify patients that are transitioning through menopause that really should see a cardiologist for a preventive cardiology assessment prior to either initiation of therapy or, or even without therapy being on, on the burner in front of us in terms of a therapeutic option? Right. For, for all women, um, uh, you certainly recommend having a you know, cardiovascular risk assessment, which starts with just measuring the traditional risk factors, blood pressure, lipids, um, uh, you know, A1C or for glucose, uh, assessing body mass index, uh, reviewing family history, assessing for a smoking history. There's even some you know, newer um, blood tests like a lipoprotein little A, which can put people in, in at higher risk. And then asking women about, you know, did they have a history of a, a pregnancy with preeclampsia? Again, that can last, you know, that risk can be even decades after their index pregnancy. Um, and then asking them about, um, you know, the age of onset of, of menopause. Um, and so these additional female specific factors um, may help uh, then, you know, prompt say you, ha you have some of either the traditional risk factors, or you have some of these newer risk factors, you know, be a good time to, you know, see a preventive cardiologist, particularly if there's a strong family history of uh, early onset cardiovascular disease, I really like to see those patients. Um, or if they have a severe lipid disorder, if the LDL is above 190, that's, you know, strongly suggestive of familial hypocholesterolemia. Hopefully that would have been identified uh, younger in oh, life yeah. and started earlier, but you'd be surprised. I sometimes see women that doesn't get identified until later in life. And so those are definitely patients that I'd like to see. Um, but I'm, I, I'm happy to see, I really, the best intervention is, is prevention. So anybody who has these risk factors, uh, and the first step is understanding, you know, these newer risk factors that are not in that sort of the, the risk calculator, uh, because of those are present, um, more intensive preventive recommendations um, should be implemented. Thank you so much. It's so important to think about all those additional modifiers that really do take us from, you know, just the facts to the arts and the science of medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's good talking with you.